Welcome to Jerusalem to the seventh round of Gideon Yafet Cup 2018. We are already in the middle of the round and we will start with the first game and probably one of the most critical games of the whole tournament, Eventure Gelfand. To remind you, Boris Gelfand is on four out of six and he's sharing the lead with Jan Nipomnichi of Russia who is facing his compatriot Peter Svidla. But now we are on Ivanchu Gelfand. These two have played a lot of games between each other, over 100 games. And almost always it is a fierce battles and very principled one. Here we see the same. Ivanchuk is not having a great tournament. He is actually in minus two, two out of six. But for him it also a chance to change the situation. Four hours ago still. So if he has a good day today and tomorrow he still can be among top three. Anyways, Ivan to Gelfand, we see a very sharp battle in English opening. Uh, Gelfand opens up the initiative on the, queen's, on the king's flag and trying to break through with h5 and probably h4. Let's have a look at the position. White have a very strong outpost on c5 for his knight. And that's where Ivan Juk wants his knight to go. But probably before that, he may consider playing something like b3 in this position and then to put a bishop on a3. That would be sort of a good plan. But Black is also having hit its trumps. That's a bit of d2 it was played. And now maybe Gelfand should consider something very direct. I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's, it has been kept. h4. The point means that if you respond with g4, I'm not going to knight d6 to play h3. I play an intermediate move, h3. And then that is probably white because gf, hg, and that's a problem. Especially in these structures, Black should not play passively. Because this, this square on c5 is an ideal for possible for white pieces. He can build up with a knight and maybe with a bishop in some lines. But the, the center's formation is favoring black anyways, because the strong box d5 and e4 limit white pieces. And I can play h4 now. Anyways, very, very tense battle here. And once again, it's four rounds to go, two today and two tomorrow morning. And that would determine the winner of Gideon Yafet Cup 2018. As we already spoke about it, the strongest tournament of the year in Israel and one of the strongest ever. Six stars in a field of uh, Gideon Yafet Cup and more stars in an open tournament. We will talk about open event later on. The open event with 16 grandmasters and several of them are very, very strong, about 2700. Uh, well, the next game we will be talking about, I'll switch now, it's Nipomnishi Svidla. Uh, Jan Nipomnishi from Russia, he is also on 4 out of 6 against Peter Svidla. Peter was, was chasing the leaders in the first days, but then yesterday he lost 2-0 against Boris Gelfand, and now he's only on 2 and a half. Nipomnishi is playing a sort of anti martial line, slow, rather slow line, but with, a, with an attempt to get slight pressure in the center and then to break through properly with g3, f4. Uh, Swidler is doing reasonably well, I don't see any major problem with him. Peter is a frequent guest to our shores, actually. He played in Gideon Yafet tournament in 2014. That time it was a format for match and he he managed to beat Boris Gelfand in this principled match uh, in 2014. And now uh, this biannual event which was uh, in 2016, somewhat less impressive. In 2018, is in the full swing with a fantastic field and uh, very generous prizes, thanks to the sponsor of the tournament, Gilad Yafet, the son of Gideon Yafet. So we are here, and the third game of the day, of course, we'll be talking about is Anna Vizichuk versus Georg Meyer, which I'll shortly see it on our main, main screen. Here it is. Anna has been doing fantastically so far. She has scored six draws against the top players, she drew twice against Zvidla, Nipomishi and uh, Ivanche. Uh, six draws doesn't sound like a great achievement, but let's not forget, she's the less lowest rated top player in a tournament, and she's playing all the top men in the world, and she's doing it very, very impressively. Um, I would say even that she somewhat underscored, she at least missed the very good opportunities versus Swidler and Nipomishi. So if she had been a bit more aggressive, maybe she, had, she could have scored even more. But of course for her it is very important to feel herself that she can compete on par with such a top players. Now she's playing against Georg Meyer from Germany. Georg here in this tournament, he got an invitation mostly thanks to his 
a win in Jewish Maccabi games in 2017. Uh, he's one of the top German players, uh, currently he lives in Stockholm, Sweden, but he also enjoys very much coming to Israel and we have a chance to discuss it with him and he's really impressed with what's going on. For Jerusalem such an event becomes sort of tradition and uh, it's, that's very good feeling that Jerusalem becomes an important point on, on the global chess map. Just recently uh, there, there was a major chess festival uh, dedicated to 70th year of independence to, of Israel state and we saw Vishwanathan and Anton Anatoly Karp coming over to Israel with, with simul displays and uh, some meetings and some lectures also were there. So it is very nice feeling that Jerusalem becomes a stronghold of uh, Israeli chess community and uh, in this regards all, only we can say that we praise this, this activity. Yesterday we talked with the minister Israeli Minister of Jeru for, for Jerusalem, and Zev Elkin, and he is actually promised his support throughout his tenure as a minister and possibly as a mayor of Jerusalem. He will be actually running for this position in October this year. Back to chess. So, Muzichuk Mayor, Muzichuk played the opening rather quickly, and the mayor takes his time. Probably he is not exactly happy with what's going on on, this, on the board. Uh, he takes his time, and we switch. Once again, for Ivan Chugelvin, critical moment there because Boris Gelvin has to choose what, what he's going for. Whether he's going for a break with H4 or he has other plans. So we wait and we get some moves. No, we don't get any moves so far. Let us try and see if it will be. So. Boris Gelfin is trying to play h4 at some moment, but not yet, not just yet, and we, we just expect him. Three. And we're here again, so a bunch of Gelfin please, he proceeded exactly as expected with h5, h4, very sharp battle, actually Ivanchuk allowed Boris to take on g3 and play c1, and knight went to c5, and Boris will try to, to break through all the h5 and maybe some sacrifices. That's going to be a very, very spectacular game because for Boris it's very important to develop some sort of an, uh, of an attack here. He cannot allow himself to play passively because then there's knight on c5 and bishop d4 and everything like that. But he can create some dangerous threats over, over the h5 and probably to threaten taking on g3, let's say like queen g5, it not only threatens to take on g3 in some moments, we also want to take on d4 at some moment. So he plays the first king g8 just to secure his king first. He doesn't want to allow any checks with knight and then he wants right to make a choice what to do. If you play queen b7 then rook b8 very strong and I'm coming to b2, snatching an important pawn and pressing on your position. I definitely like Boris's position. It might be positionally some, somewhat close strategically. But he has a lot of tactical play here, and uh, I would say that in rapid chess it's especially important that it is easier to play for for white, for black. Sorry. Meanwhile, uh, we switch for for Nepomniši Svidler. Now it's on our screen, and we see Nepomniši Svidler more or less the same slow maneuvering. Um, I would say that black should be completely satisfied with his position. I, I cannot see any active idea for white to proceed. But once again, in these structures. It, it is all about long maneuvered, maneuvers and some ideas and uh, I cannot see why ideas in this position because d4 is not realistic and otherwise I can play as black d5 at some moment or even to bring my knight, knight e7, g6, f4. Overall I would evaluate the position as equal but easier to play with black. It's a bit confusing how, come, how can equal position be easier to play for someone. Uh, we, are, we have to distinguish an objective evaluation and a subjective one. The subjective suggests you that you have, your, your moves are easier to spot, are easier to execute, or maybe you have several opportunities to, to preserve a balance. And if you, let's say, if you, you are easier to play, so it's easier to play for you. On the contrary, you might have an equal position, but from, from another side, that you always have to find the only moves, that your plans are not so natural and then you have to, to take your time and that can tell at the end of the game. Anyways, Nipomnichi opens up with d4, it should lead to massive liquidation and I would believe that it would be 
slight advantage for black or draw at the end of the day. And so, if I took often for discuss, and finally, the game Muzichuk Meyer we haven't seen for a long time. Muzichuk is pressing with white, she has a lot of space advantage here, but will it be enough? Will it be enough? She doesn't have uh, any concrete threats, and the knight is high uh, from f5 is looking to, to get to d4. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I like Black's position, anyways, because after after knight f5, I can I can try queen c4 check and d4 in some lines. My knight will go to d6. Very, very double edge, I would say. I mean, uh, also it looks simple, but once the things hit up and uh, black or white will have to take important decision of sacrificing an exchange. Either white will sacrifice it on d4 in some line, or black will sacrifice it on d6. Let's say the following lines, for example. Like queen c4 check, king goes to, I'm not sure, f8 or h8. Mm, how to say? And then d4. And then knight d4. That's, that's the whole idea. And, and if you play knight d6, I can take rook d6. Now you can understand why I went with the king to f8, because of the cd, I can take on c4, if you take, I can take, and after d, sorry, and after d7, king is in time to catch the pawn. If my king was on h8 now, white would be winning, because knight e6 I promote and deliver me. But with the king on f8 this combination does work, and it's not good for white to enter these complications. So that's, that's about critical parts on this game. So we switch once again for Ivan Chegevan, the game of the round. These two have a long, long history of uh, their games back to back. First time they must have played somewhere in 87, I believe, in some junior competition in, in Russia and Soviet Union. Uh, Ivanchik was representing the Ukraine Republic, Ukraine, and Gelkin was playing for Belarusian Republic, Belarus. And since then they played in different tournaments, in different formats, in official and unofficial, in rapid, classical, and blitz, everywhere. For uh, all the major tournaments in the 90s, so both, both of, of those, these two great players taking part. Gerfant was number three in the world in 1990, Ivanchik was number two in the world, or three in the world in 1991, and they were, uh, there were times where Gelfand was very high in uh, official events, he was uh, a challenger and so on. There were times when Ivanchuk was very high in rating, he won World Rapid Champion and so on. But all the times they were meeting in us in, in various tournaments and always that led to principal battles. Here we see the same. Uh, Ivanchuk is opening up a chase after Black's Rook. D8 is hanging and Black has to do something urgently. It's a very important decision now for Boris is, is, is coming. He has probably to sacrifice, but when and where? Knight takes his 3 let's have a look. Knight takes his 3 if he can't take it on his 3 it will be great, but I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's very good. I mean, it's, it's, it's reasonable, but... Now, if King f1, Rook d6, and Rook comes to f6, so Rook has... To... Oh, maybe it's strong, really. So he cannot do it as white, because after King f1, Rook d6, and he can play Rook f2. But, after Knight e3, White has an intermediate move, which would be Bishop d8. And then I want to take, because now your queen is in play. The question is whether black can do something smart. If he takes on g3, it's still bishop d8, and there is no major difference. Let's try a look, have a look. Bishop takes d8. Now rook h1 does not deliver a mate or anything. So this would not work. So what do we do here? Knight takes on d4. No, it doesn't work. Rook d6 and rook f6 is an option, but white had, has an idea of bringing the bishop on f4. Imagine white manages to transfer the bishop from a5 to c7 to f4 to install it there. White would be winning. He would simply put an end to all black attack and, and, and it would be winning. So black has to act extremely vigorously to, to, stop, to stop white from bringing this bishop back. And also, of course, not to lose too much of a material. Just black is playing like his idea, he delivers a mate. If he does not deliver a mate, he will be in trouble. So let us, let us think what can be played. Boris takes his time, and it's actually a very critical decision. Very critical decision. Once again, this knight e3, I think he may have hope, built his hopes on that. Then bishop takes d8, and I sort of take a queen away. You cannot take on d8, you cannot take on e3, and then only I will take on e3. So what can do? What Boris can do? Let's say a natural move would be rook d6, maybe just rook d6, I would say. And after bishop c7, not to move the rook, not to allow bishop to fall, just to leave it there. 
After bishop d6, I will take with the bishop, and my black bishop will join an attack. Something quite unusual to make a slow move in such a position, but maybe that's, that's a risky thing. Let's say queen h6, trying to move away from, from all these checks, and maybe knight e3 is coming. Or actually, here knight is knight e3. Here knight e3 is going to be Because if you take fe, it's still made, or sort of. You can't play rook f2 because I'm taking on c1. And if you take on d6, I can just take back on d6. And that would be a critical position. So let us see what has been played indeed. Did he take on e3 or we shall get moves anytime soon? Not, sh not sure what, what, was, what was indeed played in this game, or maybe it was not. Still, not very or it's, it looks like, like there was some move, but knight, knight takes e3. No, it can't be moved because knight e3, bishop d8, and what, what, what will he do? It's, it's a, what you see on the screen is a line from our analysis. It's not the, something that we got from the game. I'm not sure we shall get the moves soon. Meanwhile, just before we fully focus on this game, Meanwhile, let's have a short look on Nipomnishi Swidler on another leading board. Jan Nipomnishi, also on 4 out of 6, as well as Gelfand, he is trying to win against, against Peter Swidler, and he actually has reached certain, pro certain progress. Look, he, uh, we thought that Swidler is doing well, and I think he was doing well, but at this point it's not exactly clear how, how he proceeds, because Rook invaded to d6. Now, if you play b3, I just play Rook to b6, I stop your pawn, you cannot really push it forward, and then I threaten to play queen e5, and your king is insecure. I'm not sure I like this position for black, it looked, it looked very nice for him a few moments ago, but, but now he would be happy with a draw, I guess. I mean, it's not, it's not the position you, you, you like to defend with black. I'm not sure. So, if I'm to give on knight takes g3, we, we switch back there, so things are unleashing in, in some extremely tense way. Knight takes g3 has been played. After three and a half minutes of thought for, for a huge amount of time for rapid play, you usually you spend a few seconds or half a minute or a minute or three minutes and, and Boris knew exactly when he has to spend it. So let's try and understand his idea because it might be one of the exceptional games if, if the combination does work. So what does Boris have in mind after bishop takes d8? I'm still a bit puzzled because there is no direct mate. If he takes back on d8, I will take on, on. Okay, of course he can just just play this position on without a rook and some attacking chances. But I don't think that's his idea. What was what's the move? What's what do we miss or what does he miss? Depends. Because rook h1 looks very tempting, but I just don't see a mate there. So knight take g3. Knight take g3, and Ivanchuk spends a lot of time and he's down to. To his last two minutes to to come up with the move. What what exactly is the line here? Let's let's try and understand. I'm not I'm not convinced, but maybe there is some hidden treasure here. So what 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 can he do? If he plays rook eight, he just took back on date like like we believe it is a move. But that's that's well that's sort of losing a momentum. Yes, he will have some plays there and did. But after group d6, like we saw, and uh, later sacrificed on d6, it was a much better version. Takes and now bishop h6, yes, but he sacrificed the whole group. The line which I suggested was involving an exchange sacrifice. And now he will probably play bishop h6, and he will create some threats, but it's not not as good as it could have been. Yeah. Let's say queen g5 now, and bishop d6 or h6. Maybe good enough for a draw, but not more. It looked like much more, much more promising than it is. That is now. Meanwhile, uh, eventually, plays queen b8, pinning the bishops, and it looks like a very strong move to me, because now you cannot play bishop h6, and if you take on e3, and it's it's probably the only move to make. I go king f1, and you cannot really release your bishops from f8 on e8. It looks like it looks like. Boris went long at some moment. But wait, there, are, there is a hidden resource now, rook to h5. Maybe I'm still alive. g4. 
G4 seems like an only move, otherwise I go rook f5 and it's made. G4 and maybe I can try something like rook h3. I know it looks it looks it looks strange, but but maybe it's it's enough for a draw. Who knows? Queen B8 has been played. Ivanchuk for one and a half minute and uh, Galvin with two and a half minute if we believe the electronic clocks we we get a signal from. Meanwhile, uh, Nipomnichi also sacrifices a pawn, looking for an enemy's rook h5, and it was played by Gelfand. So that's probably the only chance, and, and he finds that g4 would, will be played no other move. g4, and then probably rook h3. At least I don't see any other options for that. Rook h3 trying to at least create a chaos around White's king. Does he have any other move? Not likely, not likely, because the rook is in play and uh, rook g5, rook g5 might be moved to attack or rook h4. It looks a bit ugly, but maybe if I get this pawn on g4, it's, it's not too bad. Meanwhile, Nipponichi has sacrificed a pawn and trying to deliver some mate, and the same actually was in a game with a check against Meyer. She sacrificed pawn and tries to create some threats. I'm not sure, I'm not sure it was a wise solution because uh, she had a nice pool and instead of that she is trying now to prove that he has a, she has a compensation. So that's a bit... But she, she finally she decided to play very ambitious chess and let's hope this strategy will succeed or at least she will not regret if, if, if she will make another draw with that would be also not a bad result. One and a half minute for... for uh, from Muzichuk and Meyer, but in Ivanchuk, Ivanchuk and Gilbert we see that only a few seconds have left. G4, rook G5 has been played and Ivanchuk has to come up with a move. Look, if he takes on E8, then I can play rook to G4, rook takes G4. That must be bad for, for black. It must be bad for black, but practically, practically you have a lot of chances, you know, a lot of checks, the white king is exposed. So that's the difference between rapid chess and classical one. In classical Gelfand would never go for such a for such a sacrifice. It's obviously dubious. Uh, and here he feels that with uh, little time left for Ivanchuk it would be extremely diff diff difficult to find a refutation. But there is a refutation I, I see it here actually. Knight goes to e6. It takes away the little important square f4 and now it's written made and you cannot take on e6 because then queen e6 check. So that's why what has happened? What has happened in the game? After rook h4 g5, rook c3 played Ivanchi. He wants to drive away white's queen from black queen from e3. It also looks like a powerful move actually. Queen takes to d4 and now he can take on e8. Maybe that's his idea after he draws this. Now queen e8 and knight e6 will actually put an end to a black hopes probably. That is a very dramatic game, you know. Ivanchuk, who is, who ha, who is having a poor tournament, can actually have an impact in a fight for first place. So, Queen took to e8, and now Rook g4, the knight e6, probably that what he has in mind. Meanwhile, Gelfand is thinking he, he does have a bit of time, probably more than Ivanchuk, but that's not about time in this position anymore, because if he, you are Rook and Knight down, you have to prove something fast or you can be you can be just losing immediately. Nipponishi lost a threat in his game and, and he is it looks like like a momentum on Switzerland's side now. But also a reversal of fortune, you know, if now Nipponishi and Gelfan both of them lose then, then the tournament just remains open for grabs. I mean everyone will have a chance I believe with three rounds to go, now body more than, than than plus one. It would be something very, very unusual then uh, both Swidler and Muzichuk and Meyer will have a chance. Probably not Ivanchuk because but maybe now he will just point, point behind the leaders. Incredible, incredible drama here in Jerusalem. So, g4, rook, rook g5, and rook c3, queen d4, and Ivanchuk played queen a8 last seconds for Gelfand to come up with some solution, but uh, there is no solution actually. He can only pose some practical problems. Maybe he find it, finds a way, but it's highly unlike, unlikely, once again, rook g4 natural move, but the knight comes to e6 with a devastating effect. You cannot take, and you cannot not to take, basically. Basically, it would be, it would be over. Uh, well, let us see what's going on. We don't get any more moves. Mm. 
let's let's shortly jump to new publishers with that's another yeah rook g4 knight e6 actually happened in in a bunch of and i expect boris to resign unfortunately because he has to play queen f6 check and then to trade queens and if you trade queens in such a position then it's all over but who knows who knows uh, uh, queen f6 maybe with just a few seconds he will he will manage to confuse the somehow for example now what to play Rook f3 is a tempting move, but it, but it doesn't work, so you have to go king g1, or king e1, for that matter. And then simply f8. Of course, black is a whole rook down and the position is lost, but no, no. not much of a help, not much of a help here for Boris Gerben. Here, king h1 and rook h4, rook h3, it looks, it looks pretty, pretty bad. What else? Bunch of careful for Nipomnish with the repeating moves and Nipomnish is still trying to play for a win in a position when he's probably not better, but he's he's trying to to press on clock, he has much more time. And Ivan Gelfand, will we get any update from this game? We don't get it for some reason. Yeah, that's exactly what happened actually. Queen d4, king h1, rook g4, the, the line which we anticipated. And, uh, well, probably there is no later on. to go from we don't get enough there, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why we don't get most because maybe the game has been finished already, and that's, that's the only sensible explanation. I don't see any, any possible move, actually, for, for Boris to end this. So Nipomnish Swither is like that now. Nipomnish Swither here is a perpetual, probably on the board. Yeah, Queen G6, Queen 7 nothing to see anymore, just a draw. Well for the game, Nipomnish tried to to seek for his chances, but Swither was actually better on many stages. Yes, and Ivanchik won his game against Gelfand. So we see at this moment that that's how the game ended. And we see Boris Gelfand losing after a very risky attack he took a lot of responsibility by going all in basically and missed miss it in a very important moment you remember we, we discussed this position before knight takes g3 it was a wrong decision and unfortunately boris is now trailing uh Jan Nipomnici by half a point and the last game of the round is muzici versus Meyer. what's going on there we don't get moves it looks it looks like black Meyer is better but uh, he has an extra pawn but it should, should be able to hold it. F4 looks, yeah, that's, that's now the position on the screen. The only game in running. Once again, Ivanchuk won against Gelfand and Nipomnich Swidler has been drawn. And we see some, some sort of an end game which is better for, for Meyer, but, but how better? How much better is it? I mean, look, he is two pawns up, two pawns up, that's quite something. Two pawns up. But maybe, just maybe, Anna will manage to hold it. Not very likely, not very likely, as two pawns are two pawns, but Rupen games known for, you know, for many chances for defending side. So let us see. Both players are very low in time, must be very nervous now. A5, actually, actually, sort of, sort of responsible decision by Mar, let's say. Anna can play now rook d6 check, king e7 and rook h6 grabbing this pawn. And then uh, that's that's precisely what happens. Rook h6, a4 he plays. Now probably rook takes h7. I think we are going to witness some 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 very interesting rook ending. I feel by this moment that it should be holdable for white, but not simple, definitely not with half a minute to go as Anna has, but she's still, she's a good technical player, so she can be able to hold it, let's say king e3 and then trying to, to play c6 and to get a and c pawn, famous f and h, h and a and c pawns, let's see if she manages to hold it, very unpleasant ending, but still very close to a draw, Maybe g6, she can start g6, king f6, g7, king f7, and then something like uh, king e3. But obviously not not a simple defensive task. She had a pleasant advantage earlier on, but then she misplayed it. And yes, she played c6, takes and she is aiming 
for some sort of uh, rook ending, which is which might be a draw, but as well might be lost. So it is a decisive game of the round. Actually, if Muzicuk had managed to 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 win this one, she would have joined the leaders. Oh no, no, she would have joined Boris Gelfand in second place. Yeah, but so far Nepomni she is leading with uh, four and a half out of seven. Gelfand is on four out of seven, and Swidler on three and a half. So King F5 has been played by by Meyer. Probably Rook takes C6. King G5, King E3. Looks very very subtle. Yeah, that would happen indeed. 50 seconds for both players. Uh, don't ask me about evaluation of this endgame. This rook endgames are extremely tricky. I have just published a huge article on, on rook endgames on chess pro and uh, and although I published it and I analyzed it like for a couple of weeks, still so many hidden treasures, so many subtleties there, you cannot really even start imagining. I mean, even top grandmasters lose their way trying to, to understand what's going on. So rook c4, I would, I would believe that objectively this position is one for black at this stage. King should go to b6 and then the pawn will be marching, marching, but uh, it's still it's still not not so simple. Let's see. King goes to d2 now, and then if his king will go to b6, now king goes to b6, and then starting pushing pawns. Yes, that that what happens. It looks like it looks like a big 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 problems for Anna. Notably, she managed to hold Nipomnishi and Ivanchuk and Swindler for 1 1 draws. But uh, here uh, against uh, Georg Meyer, player who is uh, not the highest rated and uh, didn't have much of success so far in this tournament, he is posing very big problems. So, King e6, King d2. He doesn't go for some reason, he does not go to c6 and b6. I'm, I'm a bit confused why so. He may have a reason for not going there. Or maybe he is also in a time trouble and just trying to, to come. Yeah, no, he went to c6 now. King e2, king d7, king d2, king c6. So what what exactly is his point here? Or her point? Why she didn't go to, to d2 immediately? Why now she, he, uh, rook h5? Okay, it's the only chance for, 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 for white is this. If you go a3, I go rook a5 back. If you go king b6, I can install at some moment my rook on h3, but king b6 here must be must be strong. King b6 here, pre preventing. Now I'm ready to play a3. If you allow me to go with the king to b b5 and b4, it must be lost. I cannot see a way to hold it for white. There must be something, but but it's uh, rook e5. The rook e5 is is like it looks like a desperate move. Rook e5. I don't like this move at all. Probably she simply didn't find any way to hold and she made this move on the last seconds. Yeah, painful loss for Anna. Yes, Mayer wins. The game is over. And uh, that ends up round 7 here in Jerusalem. Uh, once again, the two top games of the round, Ivanchuk Gelfand and Nipomnishis Villa. Ivanchuk won and uh, took Gelfand out of leading command. So now yeah, Nipomnishi with four and a half out of seven. Boris Gelfand on four. And uh, well, we don't have ah, and and Meyer is on three and a half. But Meyer is suddenly on the third third place with three and a half points. So we are posing with a main group with a Midon Yafit Cup here, and we will be switching shortly to the games of open tournament which are going to be covered separately. Stay with us. And we are back in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, there is a break between the games in Gideon Jaffet Cup and we will talk about uh, an open, an ACP Open Chess tournament here, which runs in parallel seven rounds, very strong field, uh, 16 grandmasters, many strong players, famous women players, former world women champions, uh, Maria Muzichuk and Anna Ushenina taking part. 
And after five rounds, with just two rounds to go, Arkady Nijic is leading the field with five out of five. You now see the table, the scoring table. He got five out of five. Uh, he's a tournament favorite. That's not surprising. He's an elite, but five out of five is quite something. Anyways, we see Tamir Nabati, one of the highest rated Israeli players, is, is chasing him with four out of five. Tamir has not been as impressive as, as, as Arkady so far. He managed to escape a couple of times. Most notably, his game against the veteran Israeli player Nathan Birenboim was the one that caused a lot of discussions because Nathan Birenboim with Black played a fantastic game just to misplay it and to allow Tamir to escape on move 40. Uh, uh, to mention that, uh, Nathan Birma, who is 68, has been having a great tournament. He had 3 out of 3 and he had uh, Nabati on ropes and if he would have won this game he would have 4 out of 4 uh, and some 2900 performance. But unfortunately he drew and then he lost his next game and uh, we can debate just quite a bit. So Nijic is 5 out of 5 and one of the important games uh, he won was in round 5 when he had 4 out of 4 and played one of the top Israeli young players, uh, Avital Borukovsky. We shall see it immediately and just give you a short impressions on what's going on. Once again, the tournament is incredibly strong, but we're just running short of time to show you all the games from there, or we'll just focus on, on this one, and maybe tomorrow we'll also uh, see the, the score table and talk about the top players. Uh, that was a game of Nijic against Borukovsky. Akari Nijic is a very strong theoretician, and he mostly opens E4. E4, E5, and he goes for Rui Lopez exchange the line, which was favored by Bobby Fischer. And in this very line, Bobby Fischer won a couple of games. I remember, maybe it was Fischer Portage in this, in this line, uh, Olympiad in Havana in 1966. Yes, it, it, it is so called Gligorish variation, but uh, it's quite funny that it's Gligorish variation, but Gligorish actually also lost the, the game against Fischer in this line. So it, it, is, it is quite a dangerous line for black and if you don't know, if you don't know your series, black you easily go down and that's what happened in this game. This all has been pretty theoretical so far and we see that here Borukovsky knowledge uh, basically expired. He didn't know what to do. He spent about 20 minutes for his next move and it is an unfortunate move, probably so, because look what happened. He played bishop e7. If I remember well, knight e7 was, was the main option or knight to h6. Bishop e7. Now, if Black has managed to play rook d8 to, to trade everything, and he would be doing all okay, but then happened a5, ruining the pawn structure, b5, and knight f4. Now, I want to go to d5, and then c5 pawn becomes vulnerable. b4 is a logical repost there, but then knight d5, bishop d6, and here comes something that probably Borukovsky had missed when he went for the position. Knight b6 check. Not taking, but just a check. What's the point? King goes to b7, b8. King b7 was another option, but probably not a better one. And then rook takes d6. Typical exchange sacrifice. Also, Fisher in his game since this line has sacrificed an exchange in similar circumstances. Taking on d6, rook takes d6. And now pawn on c5 is going as well as the pawn on b4, and white gets a tremendous compensation. Bishop went to b5, bishop takes e4 was an option, another option, but after a long thought, 10 minutes long, um, Borukovsky preferred bishop b5, he preserves the control over important d7 square, and that, that was really important because otherwise he, he risked getting made it. Now he does not get made it, but after knight e6, knight e7, knight takes c5, rook d8, it looks like, for a moment, it looks like black is okay, he's solidified, but Bishop f4, very important move. You can take on d6 because knight on e7 is going to lose. King a7 is the only move. And then knight bd7. He prevents an exchange of, of, of rooks. Uh, usually, if you have a compensation for an exchange, it's a good strategy to, prefer, pre to preserve your rook because, let's say, if you have rook and bishop and several pawns for rook, it's better to preserve rook and then to, to, to start snatching pawns and your rook will support your pawns. If you left only with one bishop or one knight, uh, so if you exchange down even for two or three pawns, it usually can be a problem because opponent's rook can easily attack your pawns when you don't have your rook. So knight e7, rook e8, an attempt to get counterplay knight f5 now with a threat, but knight h has everything under control, h4, making a room for a king. Now knight f5 doesn't work, knight g6 has to be played. Bishop e3, once again creating threats against the king. King e8, rook d4. 
I'm not sure Rook D4 is the strongest one, but he, he goes for a technical solution. He wants to pick another pawn and then to convert it. That's actually what happens. Taking on D7, Knight takes D7, Knight E5, Knight B6 check and Rook B4. Now White has three pawns for an exchange. Black's king is still exposed and basically the game is just technically technically winning. Let's see how Nadish converts it. It took him quite quite time, but he was never quite in up to converting it. Let's say knight c6, rook a4, rook d1, king h2, rook e5. Actually, Borukovsky put, puts up an, a decent fight, but it just it's just not enough. It's simply not enough. He he's a material down, so c3, b4, knight solidifies everything, and then brings his rook in the, into the game once again through a2, c4. Some attempt to get well, a counterplay. He sacrificed back an exchange, getting some pawns back, but it's not enough. Knight c4. And white is a clean pawn on, pawn up in the rook and game. What's more, his king is very well placed. Let's say if in this position the king was on g1, black would not be in trouble at all. He would play rook d4 at some moment. It would not be a problem to hold it. It's, uh, as always, in the endgame, uh, the position of the king has is a decisive factor. And look, Nadic allows to himself very, very old-looking move rook b2, but he, the, the very reason that his king on f4 is so active that he can in way to f5, play f4, he can allow to himself such a move like rook b2. I'm not exactly sure it's the strongest way. I would consider playing rook a8 and rook g8. Probably he didn't consider it as well, but decided to go just to use his king's position, and it actually pays off, he just gets, gets all the pawns and starts rolling. Basically, technical part is easy here, and uh, in a few moves, black resigned. Uh, powerful win by Nidic, so today he is on 5 out of 5, and let's see the pairings of the round, which starts exactly at this moment, now, when while we talk. Round 6. We see on the top board Yevgeny Zanan, young, promising Israeli player. Yevgeny uh, made an aliyah to Israel some 10 years ago from St. Petersburg, maybe a bit less than 10 years ago. Uh, for some, quite some time he was a promising junior, but not more than that. But then he started taking his chess very seriously. He now works with left sockets. And uh, he improved a lot. He already has been around 2500 for for half a year or so on, and I believe he might become a player to actually to make to make it into the news. 2497 doesn't look impressive at the age of 19, but I I'd say that I believe he would be at least 2550 very soon. On board too we have Tamir Nabati, uh, one of the top Israeli players and a member of our Olympic team, playing against another strong Israeli junior grandmaster Ori Kobo. Uh, Ori has been consistently over 2500 for quite some time, then he had some drop and then now he regained it back. Uh, I think it would be a very interesting battle. And board 3, Tad Baron against uh, Daniel Yufa. These are critical matchups for round 6. Once again, to remind you, it's just uh, two rounds to go. So, Nidic, if, he, if Nidic managed to hold today, he would be in a very good position to claim an outright tournament win. And of course, for Tamir Nabati, when he plays with White against uh, Ori Kobo, it's very important to win because if he wants uh, to, to fight for first place or even for a second place, it's absolutely must win situation for him. And he has White and he has to prove himself. In this tournament, we also have, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of lady players. And Maria Muzichuk, former world champion, very, very strong player. She's 25 20 and she's a constant top, top 5, top 7 women player in the world. There are also a lot of uh, veteran players, as I mentioned. We see Nathan Birnbaum on three and a half points. We see uh, Yehuda Greenfeld, one of the oldest members of Israeli national teams also. He's, uh, he has been playing in an uh, interzonal tournament in Riga in 1979, where I guess most of our spectators haven't been born yet. Uh, we have David Kudishevich, former Soviet prodigy, who at his prime time as a junior has beaten Anatoly Karpov in some tournaments and, and he, he was considered almost as strong as, as Anatoly at the end of 60s. Uh, we have once again women matchups. Yulia Schweiger, the strongest Israeli 
female player. He's well, she's constantly above 2400. She gets a good training as well because she she's a wife of Arkady Nadic, and uh, so having such a trainer at home obviously helps. She plays against Ina Agris, who happens to be not sure if if a wife, but let's say a partner, the wife of of Georg Meyer, who plays who plays in in the main tournament. So we have a lot of interesting matchups here, and once again many juniors, many 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 good side events. As I mentioned, you can see on this table, there are five events in total which include the tournament for amateurs and for lower rated categories. We have a lot of junior players, kids, veterans and really that has been a huge effort here to bring in Jerusalem real chess festival and of course we thank again our main organizers and sponsors, especially Mr. Gilad Yafet who contributed his time, his efforts and his financial uh, resources to make this happen. So we now switch to the games of round 6 and shortly we will have them on our screen.